In 2019, a dedicated team of metal detectorists gathered from across the UK at an anonymous field in Lincolnshire. With the permission of the landowner, a search was soon underway, but within only a few minutes, it became apparent that something very special lay hidden beneath the soil. These first discoveries were reported to the British Museum's Portable Antiquity Scheme, Lincoln Branch, and the location, previously unknown to the historical record, was assessed to be one of national significance. With a need to preserve the remaining artefacts, an excavation and community outreach project was swiftly planned. Over 10 days in September 2020, a team from Network Archaeology, assisted by the detectorists, raced to recover the human remains and grave goods of those who had been buried here during one of the most tumultuous yet uncharted times in British history. Commonly referred to as the Dark Ages, it was an era beset by sudden and dramatic climate change and one of the first recorded outbreaks of plague. Some 1,400 years later, a new and unforeseen pandemic was also leaving its mark, disrupting the hopes of actively involving local people in the dig. But the project would adapt and be reimagined, now using social media to work virtually with armchair archaeologists. What had been envisaged as a community outreach project quickly gained a worldwide audience. By the end of the excavation, the dedicated social media pages had accumulated over 100,000 views. There seemed to be a genuine desire to learn more about the site at Cameringham and the individuals who had been buried here following the collapse of Roman rule in Britain. They were invaders, warriors and pagans, but perhaps also something more complex and captivating. These people are the Anglo-Saxons. Just to the north of the city of Lincoln, the limestone escarpment, known as the Lincoln Edge, provides sweeping views across the broad levels of the Trent Valley. Along the route towards the Humber lie many small settlements known collectively as Ridge Villages. It is just above the village of Cameringham that we find the field which attracted the detectorists. There was little to distinguish this particular field from a multitude of similar ones in the area. But this choice would prove to be a fortunate one. We were sat in the car. Trevor had his machine on his lap. So as soon as he got out of the, got out of the car, he switched his machine on and waved it just to the one side, had a signal, it went like that, and it was half of uh, an Anglo-Saxon penannula brooch. So after that, virtually every signal that we got was either a brooch or a broken brooch. Around 30 different items, we contacted Lisa Brundle, who is the Fines Liaison Officer for Lincolnshire. Uh, she came out and catalogued everything that we'd found, and then she took them off to the University of Lincoln for conservation and restoration. the site and immediately recognised that yes, this is a site which could be a great significant site. Because the objects they found were very diagnostic of what we find in graves in the 5th and 6th centuries. And what makes this site particularly important is the fact that it is 
a potential mixed rite cemetery, so both inhumation and cremation. And to have located this site so close to Lincoln is really significant historically. One of the beautiful Anglo-Saxon brooches also provided inspiration for the project logo. At the base of the brooch is an image of what appears to be a curious moustached man. This was perhaps incorporated as a symbol of good fortune for the wearer, something the team hoped might endure for them throughout the dig. On the 1st of September 2020, the lead team from Network Archaeology arrives to lay out the first exploratory trenches and install all the facilities and equipment needed for the dig. The success of the project depends on the kind permission of the landowner, Andrew Deeg, who has granted a precious 10 days from his farming season for the excavations to proceed. The first thing that we do on the site is we've done an initial walkover survey. So Lisa Brundle from the Portable Antiquity Scheme in the British Museum um, brought a team of uh, volunteers on site and they walked up and down and they collected any of the surface finds. And that can give us an idea of the concentrations of finds and can really inform where we place our trenches. The second phase was a magnetometry survey, uh, so it's a geophysical survey that shows the difference in magnetic values under the soil. But already we found what looks like uh, the burnt remains of a pot, and we think this is a possible cremation urn. So somebody would have been cremated, the remains would have been placed in this pot, and it would have been buried in the ground. It's only very initial findings we've found so far, but it's amazing we found that within the first three metres of Earth's trench. One particular concern for the archaeological team is the depth of the plough soil. Since only a few inches lie between the surface and the limestone bedrock, artefacts such as pottery and human remains are vulnerable to damage by ploughing. Only time will tell how much still remains intact beneath this layer. Towards the far end of the field, work is steadily progressing in the southern trench. It is here that the first excavation of an identified skeleton will commence. With what appears to be a metal shield boss just penetrating above the surface, hopes are high that a Saxon warrior might lie directly beneath. This alone could make this grave quite special, as burials with weapon grave goods are relatively uncommon in this part of the country. In other areas, the confirmed finds are somewhat meagre and disappointing. By the end of the second day, fears grow that the anticipated graveyard might now be no more than a thin residue of broken pottery and bone. The third day of the dig brings a welcome turn of events. In the northern trench extension, not one, but two cremation urns are discovered, and work to excavate them starts immediately. Can we collect the soil? It is remarkable that they have survived so close to the surface. In part, this is due to the cut, which was made for each pot, penetrating some depth into the subsoil and limestone bedrock. If it was not for this, they may have been destroyed many decades ago. The detectorist team is sometimes widely dispersed across the site, making use of every available minute to comb the earth for as yet undiscovered items. It's certainly not a fruitless search, as quite frequently, small fragments of Anglo-Saxon metalwork will turn up. Every artefact recovered provides a glimmer of new light in our understanding of this period. During the Second World War, many grazing pastures for sheep and cattle were turned over to arable land for food production. Locating and preserving artefacts buried beneath working farmland is a challenge for present-day archaeologists. 
I think the main thing is that the technological developments that have happened in agriculture over the last 200 years, but particularly since the Second World War. A hundred years ago, ploughs were pulled by an oxen or a steam powered uh, engine. Those ploughs were much lighter, um, much more difficult to manoeuvre. Today, they're much sharper, they can um, glide through the earth much more uh, easily and potentially can get deeper. Just through the natural development of technology, that there is a greater risk to buried archaeology when it's as shallow as the archaeology we've seen here. And inevitably, that means that archaeological material that may have been once a bit more deeply buried is, is no longer deeply buried and is much more vulnerable to being hit by the plough. It's lucky that we've got the ability to recover artefacts from the plough zone, as these metal detectorists did a year ago, and pinpoint where these archaeological sites are. Now that the two cremation urns have been meticulously excavated, they will be recorded in situ by the use of photogrammetry, a technique we will see in greater detail later. Somewhat detached from the excitement of the Northern Trench, the two archaeologists assigned to excavate the burial here are making cautious progress. It's looking more probable that the iron artefact is actually a Saxon shield boss. But even more significantly, there is not one, but two skeletons placed side by side in the same grave. We're concentrating now on getting this double burial out. Um, it's hard enough getting, getting one out, now having to get two out at once. We have to lift this in a multi-stage process. Usually what we'd do is we'd expose the skeletons, uh, record them and then lift them in one go. Um, unfortunately, because of these grave goods and their importance and the fragility, we can't do that. It has to be a multi-stage process. Um, so they kind of take you through the bodies. This is the first one we found, um, this individual on, on the, uh, the left-hand side. Um, and we came across uh, this here, which is the top of a metal circular iron artefact. Uh, and we suspect this to be a shield boss. We'd like to expose more of that, but that's got to be the last thing we do at this point because it's, uh, these uh, metal artefacts are so fragile. Um, also, we have this iron blade here just inside the pelvis, and we assume that's a, um, a knife that's been on the, uh, on the belt of the individual and it's just fallen down um, into the pelvis as the body's decomposed. We've also got evidence here of another iron item, uh, long uh, and thin, you can just see around here, this staining in the ground. Again, we're not exposing it yet until the last minute. Um, and that is probably, again, a, a spear or a spearhead that's been laid down by the side of the body. Um, the second individual, which was, uh, which was found second as well, doesn't seem to have uh, any weaponry with it at the moment, but what it has got is a large Saxon pot next to the head. And that's, that pot seems to have collapsed. Um, it's probably placed in, there was a cavity inside it, and the pressure of the soil on top of it has collapsed it down. The archaeologists assigned to this find, Raquel and Susanna, have worked resolutely for the last three days to reach this stage. Their progress has been featured in continuous updates on the project's social media pages, which are already attracting well over 27,000 visitors per day. The lift of the two skeletons will provide further appeal for archaeology enthusiasts from across the globe. With the site team leader close at hand to provide support and guidance, the systematic process of recording the artefacts in situ will soon commence. I mean, it's been cloudy all morning and then they're literally ready to photograph and the sun comes out. And it's particularly important when you've got grave goods like this that are in danger of degrading very quickly to not have to spend an hour drawing it, but rather spend five minutes taking a, a series of photographs. Can you angle it the other way? Turn the camera. Subdued. Even lighting is best for recording artefacts while they lie in situ. So, Rack, have we got ones without, with, with, with scale and without scale of everything? Yeah. Without scale as well. But conventional two dimensional photographs are just the first stage in the recording process. Uh, what we'll do then is photogrammetry, which is taking a series of photographs to build a 3D model using stricture through motion. And that's the way that we record skeletons in commercial archaeology these days. And then we'll draw over those on the computer to create a, a metrically accurate representation of the skeletons. The detail captured by the photogrammetry process is stunning, far exceeding the information recorded by hand in previous years. These reconstructed 3D images can be explored using VR headsets, 
providing professionals and members of the public alike with a chance to experience the artefacts as they appeared at the moment of excavation. Now that the recording process is completed, the first item to be removed will be the shield boss. This is unusually conical, suggesting that it may have possessed a rather fearsome point at its apex. It must have appeared quite intimidating to any adversary. After extraction, it will be dispatched to the Specialist Conservation Department at the nearby University of Lincoln. Well, at the University of Lincoln, Lincoln Conservation will be able to uh, do the work on particularly the metal objects, um, which are quite unstable once they've come out of the ground and will start to corrode or crumble. So anything like brooches or bits of shield boss, which is the central bit on the shield, you've got a big circular shield with a sort of boss in the middle, um, or bits of spearhead, uh, particularly the shield bosses. And as soon as you get them out of the ground, they start to flake into pieces. Uh, so Lincoln Conservation will be doing the necessary chemical work on that to stabilize them so they can be preserved for the future. While the two iron spearheads still remain embedded in the soil, the general extraction of the skeletons will begin. At this stage it's important to recover soil samples and identify any small items such as seeds or fibers which may provide some clues as to the environment of the time or even the nature of the clothes these individuals wore during their lifetimes. The bones will be carefully lifted, separated and recorded, then placed into bags. This methodical identification is critical to the post-excavation analysis, in particular the work of bone specialists known as osteoarchaeologists. The delicate iron blades are recovered just before the lift of the still largely intact skull. Medical bandages are employed once more to swaddle the broken pot. cocoon safely inside may lie the evidence of a celebratory funeral feast or perhaps treasured items placed here over 1,400 years ago. On the sixth day of the dig, some coordinated team effort is required at the Northern Trench. The heavy limestone blocks enclosing the Saxon grave cuts are being removed, so exposing some intriguing skeletons for the first time in centuries. Up in the northern half of the cemetery, we're finding um, a lot more inhumation, so skeletons that have been put into grave cuts, laid out with their grave goods. They seem to be laid out in a, in a relatively uh, organised fashion, almost in rows. Um, but what we are finding is there are various traditions of, of, of style of burial uh, within those. So we've got crouched burials, we've got a burial that's entirely lying on its side. We've got ones that are laid on their back with their hands over their chest, on their back with their hands down by their sides. So we're seeing a right, really diverse mix. Um, we've also got quite a diverse number of grave goods. So we've got some that we think may be warriors because they've got weapons and shields and things like that. Um, we've also got now what we think to be a female burial. We've got a couple of beads from it, a couple of nice brooches. So classic kind of Saxon female dress accessories. As with all archaeological projects, careful planning and funding is instrumental to success. My role as a community engagement officer is quite varied, but half of the role is regarding funding, and the majority of our funding is through our match funding grant. So our match funding grant looks at supporting projects and lobbying, encouraging money to be spent within the district of West Lindsay to enable us to grow as a district. Right from the metal detectors, right at the start, getting permission from the landowner to do the search, and then following the process all the way through, has actually helped us understand that if you follow the right processes, we can get the right outcomes. On this particular afternoon, the site visitors also include one of the UK's foremost experts on the Anglo-Saxon period and a founder member of the British Museum's Portable Antiquities Scheme. 
The Anglo-Saxons moved into Britain when the Roman Empire in the West collapsed in the early part of the 5th century AD. This area, uh, northern part of Lincolnshire, received very early settlement because it's straight across from the mouth of the Humber to the Germanic homelands along the North European coast. Uh, these cemeteries mark our best evidence for the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons. They're highly distinctive. So it's a, it's a burial rite with grave goods that we can date and they can tell us so much about this period. One of the things that's important about this site is, is the preservation of the bones. It's, it's good to see human remains so well preserved. At Cleetham, the, they weren't well preserved and at Sawcliffe Hill that we excavated, I'm afraid they'd gone all together. They'd completely dissolved. So this is going to fill in additional detail. This is the first find that we discovered on the whole excavation. And we thought at first that it was a, uh, a small pot. And as you can see, we've uh, opened it up and extended and Raquel's found that it's actually a gigantic cremation urn, Saxon cremation urn. So one of the most important things is that we get the, the pot out whole, the cremation urn out in one piece. We don't know what's inside. There's possibly grave goods in there. We just don't know until we get it out. What's important is that this is excavated, micro excavation taken down in spits and we can really understand the stratigraphy of the pot itself. This micro excavation will occur in the comfort of a laboratory and will really form a dig within a dig. Perhaps it will reveal more of the cultural practices of the early Anglo-Saxons during one of the most anarchic eras in British history. So this is a really interesting period that the people who were buried here and have been cremated here would have lived through because it's mostly around the sixth century and that's the sort of 500s AD. It was called the Dark Ages by people who were relying on written documents because we don't have many. And if you're relying on written documents to shed light, then you don't have much light. So the people who were buried here, the uh, people whose bones we can see behind us there, they would have lived through an incredibly turbulent time because it's mostly around the sixth century and that's the sort of 500s AD. Um, and that's a period, it's kind of a, a hundred years after the end of Roman rule. So we've got communities whose grandparents and grandparents' grandparents was lived through a huge political instability. And then by the middle of the 500s, in the 530s, there's a big volcanic eruption which completely messes up the climate. There's references to a dust veil and summers when the sun didn't shine at all, people's crops failed, people starved. And then four or five years after that, there's the first of a series of outbreaks of plague, uh, the first pandemic. At the end of that century, so maybe 50 or 60 years after that plague started, we get Christianity starting to come in. People are abandoning their old beliefs, moving over to something new. What it is a great period for is the archaeology is what can shed the light. So, you know, and you look at the stuff and you've got people wearing gilded brooches, they've got bronze items, they've got iron shields and swords and spears. They've got bright, shiny stuff, they've got beads, they've got jewelry, they've got brightly colored clothes. So this grave uh, has been producing a lot of material culture, so a lot of copper objects, a lot of brooches, um, various uh, little beads and things. And we think, given the type of grave we want, we think this is a female individual. Traditionally, they're buried with the brooches, with the beads. Um, Deanna's actually just found um, another one now, and she's, uh, she's excavating another brooch. And a lot of these items have been found here on the left-hand side of the body, just next to the, uh, the pelvis. And we probably suspect they originally held within some kind of bag um, that the person would have had on their belt. So these might be objects that they're very precious to the individual, things like uh, little decorated beads with uh, painted decoration on them, and this person's taking them with them in their bag into the afterlife. On day 10 of the dig, the archaeologists are up bright and early, and in the dawn light, yet more finds are emerging from the soil at Cameringham. The bead skeleton continues to surrender its trove of artefacts. But the dig as a whole is remarkable for the diversity of its finds. 
So it's the last day of the excavation, or I should say the last half day. We're going to be backfilling the trenches this afternoon. There are people rushing around, getting the last minute recording done, the last minute lifting of skeletons and artefacts. And overall, I think the two weeks have gone amazingly well. Uh, we've made some excellent discoveries. Some significant graves have been discovered. We've got massive variety of different types of graves, crouch burial, flexed, a number of cremations with different styles of cremation urn. Um, the diversity of, of burial practice and burial tradition on this site uh, is something that's uh, really interesting and makes it quite significant. We've obviously the highlights have probably been the double burial that we had down the s in the southern half of the cemetery. One a warrior with a spear and a shield, the other a younger individual, we're not sure what sex yet. The, the burial that uh, Diana's been excavating that has uh, all the beads and various grave goods within it. And then this one in front of me which is a burial that has I think it's maybe on six or seven brooches within one grave. Um, they're the kind of the real highlights of the excavation. It's possible that this grave is the site of at least two different burials. There is evidence of different layers of human remains and grave goods, including the first cruciform brooch, which was found on the third day of the dig. We had a brooch much, much earlier on, higher up within the backfill. It didn't seem to be associated with this skeleton, but while excavating the skeleton, we've also found quite a bit of uh, disarticulated human remains. Um, so we found a scapula, the um, sort of shoulder girdle, which we, we have one already on this skeleton, so we know there is definitely uh, another skeleton that has been here. So we seem to have uh, two cruciform brooches that seem to be making a pair. We've got this one here, um, this one is also the pair from it, it's a bit distorted by it underneath the fingers. Um, but this one and this one do seem to be a pair and you can just about see a little bit of gilding still remaining on this one. Uh, so that's a beautiful thing to have. Within a few hours, all the graves and trenches will have to be filled in and the field left completely clear of equipment and personnel. If the archaeologists are feeling the pressure of this looming deadline, they showed little outward sign. For lifting the metallic objects, it's obviously something you've got to do with a great deal of care, especially in ones like this. We do actually have some of the iron pins remaining. The iron pins, they oxidise and deteriorate a lot quicker than the, the, the copper would. Um, so it's quite rare to have those still in situ, so it's something we've got to lift with, with, with a lot of care to make sure it does stay intact. Over time, archaeologists have identified and categorised the different types of brooches which can be found in Anglo-Saxon graves. The principal classification is known as Aberg's groups. The form of the brooch giving a good indication as to its date. The earliest follow the simplest of designs, such as the examples found with this skeleton. The later types become both larger and far more ornate, sometimes embellished with intricate carvings of animals and brightly gilded too. With the hour of the deadline swiftly approaching, the concentration employed on the final artefacts seems to be particularly intense. However, there's always time for one more discovery. As always happens, right at the last minute, you always find something else really exciting. So Diana managed to find um, a set of girdle hangers in her burial. You usually find those on, on female skeletons. And what it is, is it's a pair of uh, almost look like keys that hang from a loop on the belt. And it was thought previously to symbolize a woman's power of the household, kind of almost like a ceremonial pair of keys that she has that allows her access into the home. <laughs> But well, we've been told today by Adam Daubney that it actually may represent like, maybe an amulet property to it and maybe to do with good-looking childbirth and that kind of thing. So again, these, these ideas we're having, these theories are changing all the time based on new evidence that we get. What was really interesting about that find was that the ring itself was actually Roman in date. So this is a curated artefact, an object that a Saxon person has been passed down to or that they found and they're taking it and they're reusing it in a different, uh, different way. And they're finding it important enough, they're actually putting it into the burial. So items like this, historic antique items for the Saxons obviously had some form of important significance. With practically all the finds now sealed in airtight boxes and sample tubs, all that remains is to scour the surface of the soil and bedrock. To all intents and purposes, the site is now devoid of useful archaeological information. But this is far from the end of the story.
All the artefacts collected will be carefully cleaned, catalogued and many conserved. The most important will be subject to further detailed analysis by many different specialists and the information published in journals. A final project report will also be produced and disseminated to professionals and the general public via the Searching for Saxon social media pages. When COVID restrictions are lifted, there will be further face-to-face -face events where members of the public will be able to examine many of the artefacts close at hand and perhaps plunge into the world of virtual reality too. As we have seen, the Dark Ages were so devoid of written records that these human remains, the beads and brooches and iron weaponry provides us with the light that we need to illuminate one of the most elusive yet seminal periods in British history. The foundations of the Anglo-Saxon world can still be found beneath the rich soil of Lincolnshire fields. It's been an absolutely amazing project. In some ways, uh, two weeks has felt like two days. It's gone so quickly. It's been a whirlwind with all the amazing finds we've been having. In some ways, it feels like two months. The amount of work we've been doing to try and rescue these Saxon burials.